Imagine you're out in Africa. Um, it's nighttime. Uh, you're sleeping in the back of an open vehicle. And it's so hot that you have no clothes on and you're still sweating. Um, all you can hear is the distant call of a hyena and uh, an impala snorting close by. And you're half asleep, but then your car just begins to wobble. Um, you're not quite sure what's going on. You tilt your head up and you look down towards your feet and all you can make out is your clothes bag sort of on the box next to where your feet are. And uh, just all of a sudden it disappears. Um, so you're quite startled and you sit up and grab a torch and you shine out into the darkness and all you can see is a young male lion running off into the bush carrying all your clothes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I grew up in the bush and um, now as a wildlife filmmaker I can continue to spend most of my time uh, out in the wild. Um, we choose not to have a camp. We like to move with the animals and um, uh, it keeps us close to where they are. We sleep where they are. It keeps us in touch with what is going on. And the filming vehicles that we've got are modified for filming. We like to be able to see and smell and hear everything around us. We want to be as unencumbered as possible. So we, we cut off the cab, we take the doors off and you know, fold the windscreen down, and the vehicles are just completely open. Um, this little bag incident that happened, happened last year to us while I was in Savuti filming Savage Kingdom. And it was the young male lion from the Marsh Pride that thought it would be quite funny to sneak in there grab my clothes bag and run off with it. Um, it was quite a busy night, you know, as you do, you jump into the driver's seat and you start chasing after the guy. Um, and of course, you're completely naked because now all your clothes are gone. Um, and uh, we chased him around for about 20 minutes before uh, we managed to, I managed to get all my clothes back. Um, I've actually, I've still got my bag. Um, I still take it to the bush, I still use it. I quite like this bag, um, despite the sort of holes <laughs> that, he, that he left in it. Um, I come from a, a long line of uh, Botswana bush people. Um, my great-grandfather was one of the first up there. He, he was knocking around all over the place. Um, he was a hunter. He got mauled by a lion at one point and um, involved in quite a few other misadventures, I believe. Um, my grandfather, who is that uh, man up there, he followed my, my great-grandfather into Botswana and was given the Okavango as a hunting concession uh, to shoot crocodiles specifically. Um, he was quite an intrepid guy, a bit of an adventurer, spent a lot of time on his own and he used to take these little tin boats and carve his way into the delta and um, basically uh, shoot as many crocs as he could, he could find. Um, he would go up there with... Uh, groups of guys that would do all the skinning and prepare the skins and salt them and get them ready to be taken back to South Africa to be exported off to Europe. Um, but um, he lived a wild life and, um, and really explored a vast part of the Delta in the mid-50s and early 60s. He was responsible for killing probably about 20,000 crocs during his time as a hunter um, before he himself was killed by a black mamba. Um, on one of his hunting trips, he, uh, um, he got bitten and, and, and died. Um, and now, of course, it's completely safe to swim in the Okavango, um, <coughs> which, is, which is not altogether true. But what it did is gave way to uh, another generation of, of bush people. Um, my parents then moved up into the Okavango. They... Um, took over one of his old hunting camps and kind of broke the mold a little bit. And instead of hunting, they decided to build the first photographic tourism camp um, in the Delta. And that was in 1967. Um, a few years later, my sister and I were born. Um, and we were born literally uh, into the bush and into the wilds. Um, the story goes that um, my mother had me in Mao in a small village quite close to, um, well, at the, at the base of the Okavango. And she figured that it would be safer to take me out into the bush than to leave me in the village. So at four days old, um, she picked me up and did this long boat journey up to the camp where we were living. 
And uh, um, as she arrived at the lodge, or at the campsite, um, she was getting out of the boat and onto the land, and she didn't want to pass me on to somebody else. She was with her baby, you know, protected. Um, and climbing out, she slipped and dropped me straight into the river. Um, so I was baptized into the Delta at a very <laughs> young age. Um, the life, the next four or five years, we grew up um, on, my sister and I grew up on this island out in the middle of the Delta. Um, my folks used to go into town maybe once a month at most to go and get a few supplies, get a bit of fuel. Um, and they, we lived a sort of rural life. Um, we, we lived in small reed huts. Um, you know, we lived on, we slept on the floor under mosquito nets. And, um, you know, bath time was in the river because there were no crocs at the time. Um, and in a tin bath next to the fire. Um, it was very sort of rudimentary and, uh, um, and a great existence. My folks used to go out and catch fish um, and try and subsist to a large degree. My mother had a little vegetable garden that she used to be a constant war with the wildlife, you know, fight off the porcupines that were trying to eat her tomatoes or whatever she was trying to grow. Um, but essentially, um, uh, we sort of lived off the land. My dad got a, a pot license that he used to have that he could go and shoot a few animals that he could then feed his staff or have food in the camp with. Um, but that really wasn't my dad's style. Um, he, he didn't really like the hunting side of things. And instead, um, he used to take this little yellow short tail based Land Rover that we had and we'd go out, um, track lions and find the lions and then we'd sit on them and follow them for for hours and eventually they would kill something, a buffalo or a impala or a kudu or something. And then he would use a little Land Rover and push all the lions off the kill, hop out and cut the leg off or a shoulder or a piece of meat and then he would take that home. And that's really how we got most of our, <laughs> most of our food and our meat. Um, you can imagine as a, as a little toddler how exciting that was. That was the grand adventure. Um, Looking back at how I grew up, it really sort of, you know, looks a little bit like Mowgli in the sort of Jungle Book story. Um, it, was, it was a wild life. Um, we, we grew up surrounded by predators. We had lions, hyenas, leopards, always around us. Um, and um, a lot of other animals that can kill you, elephants, hippos, um, crocs, um, and even snakes, like the ones that killed my grandfather. Um, growing up wild like that um, sort of gives you a, a sense of vulnerability. Um, you are not top dog. Um, you're living in a world full of predators, and it makes you very aware and very vigilant. And you're always very focused on what is going on around you and very perceptive um, towards the bush. Um, and I think that's where my love for the wildlife and my sort of passion and my understanding of the predator world really started, um, uh, began, where it all stemmed from. Um, very soon after um, I left school, I joined uh, two great people, uh, which most of you probably know, uh, Derek and Beverly Jaber, they explorers in residence for National Geographic, and um, they lived in the bush, and they lived where I wanted to be. And um, I I started an apprenticeship with them. Um, up until this point, um, the bush and the wild animals was really just my life. Um, it was normal, I was very familiar with it. Um, I sort of just moved through life, you know, not really appreciating uh, the upbringing I'd had. And Derek and Beverly kind of shifted that direction and made me, um, they sort of contextualized the value of my upbringing and the sort of understanding that I'd naturally accumulated by being out there. Um, they allowed me to look at nature in a very different way, in a much more philosophical way, and really delve deeper into appreciating these animals in the natural world. I was working with them for about um, 10, 12 years. And towards the end of that time, I met my wife, who was at the time having her own sort of midlife crisis. She was giving up her life as a lawyer in the big city and decided to move out into the middle of the bush with me. Um, so the two of us, we had a, a new direction and a new purpose, and we were determined that we were going to live and stay out in the bush. And 
as it happens, not long after we did that, uh, we had some children. Um, and uh, we weren't, well, we weren't going to let that stop us. So we moved everybody out into the bush and, and we decided to live out there. We both really believe that um, it's a gift to grow up wild, grow up in the bush. Um, and we wanted to, we had an opportunity to give that to our children. So uh, we're hell bent in staying out there. Um, we could slowly teach them about tracking, about the signs of the wild. We could teach them about how the bigger animals, the scarier animals, are often the more gentler animals. And um, um, we wanted them to grow up strong and have this intrinsic sense of nature and animals sort of embed into them at a very, very young age. Let them develop their own intrinsic understanding and, and compassion towards the wildlife. And luckily, those tin baths didn't evolve much in 25 years. So very, very useful. Um, it's amazing how we, often, we so often follow the path of our parents. Um, this, is a, a pic, this picture was taken in 1979. That's my, my sister and myself getting a few lessons in life right out in the middle of the Okavango. Um, and this picture was taken just over a year ago. Um, Andy took the picture. We were out there with our family, living the wildlife, being out there in the bush, um, just in a totally different uh, location. 